On today's recap of Undercover Boss, we're bringing you two exciting episodes featuring the bosses of Kendall Jackson, Wire Estate, and Boston Market as they encounter the worst employees in Undercover Boss history. I literally hate customers more than the entire world. I hate them so much. In our first episode, our boss will come face to face with an employee that's so rude and insulting that his insults had to be bleeped. I'm shocked about the language people were. I'm shocked by his attitude towards our customers. We first start with the president of Kendall Jackson Wine Estate, Rick. I'm Rick Tegner, president of Kendall Jackson Wine Estate. Which is headquartered in California. Kendall Jackson Wine Estate is the second largest family owned wine company in the world. Kendall Jackson was founded in 1982 by Jess Jackson, and he was a successful attorney that wanted to retire in the wine business. He started the company with only one location, and now they have over a thousand employees, and they see over five million cases of wine a year. Rick grew up in California, and he was from a broken home. His father was a heavy alcoholic who went to prison for multiple offenses of driving under the influence. So Rick had to work since he was a young kid. Rick gained valuable experience working in a liquor store while he was in high school. He learned a lot about sales and marketing and mastered his skill before moving to bigger positions. He met Jess in 1991 and they got along immediately. Jess was a mentor to Rick as he ran the sales department, but the last year Jess offered him the president position. But sadly, after fighting with cancer, Jess passed away a few months ago and Rick wanted to make sure to continue the legacy of Jess and make the company live forever. Rick wanted to go undercover because there is uncertainty within the company's future since Jess passed away. And because of the financial downturn, the business had less sales, so Rick wanted to go to the front lines and see what things can be improved as a company and to get it back on the right track. He'll be going undercover as Jake Williams, a grocery store worker hoping to get a job in the wine business. His employees will be told that he's a contestant on a reality TV show, and for his first job, Rick travels to California to work in the crop fields. Today I'm going to be working in Monterey, where we own over 3,000 acres of land. Everything that we do starts in the vineyard. He meets up with assistant vineyard manager Laura, and she first introduces him to the other workers, and things get very awkward when Rick tries to talk to them, not knowing that they only speak Spanish. Hi, I'm Jake. So... Laura later gives him a small dictionary so he can communicate better and then takes him for a tour and show him his first task, which is estimating how much grape that they'll be getting in the next harvest. How much fruit you're going to be getting at harvest, so we'll go around and count clusters. The job was easy, but it can be tedious and Rick struggles to count properly. He also gets tired really fast as he hasn't done this kind of job for a long time, so he takes a longer time to complete the task. He then compares his count with the other workers and again struggles to communicate with them. I was actually frustrated with myself. I never want to struggle with communication. I always think I'm a good communicator. Laura tells him that she also struggles to communicate with the Spanish-speaking workers, so that has caused a lot of problems for efficiency in their work. For his next job, Rick travels to Napa, California to work with a truck driver. Today I'm going to be working with one of our truck drivers here at the Kimmel Jackson Distribution Center. He meets with Renee, and they load the truck and start their journey. As they drive to their first location, Rick learns that Renee has worked in the company for three years. He also learns that they work long hours, which can be a risk while your work is driving a big truck. They arrive at the first location and deliver the package in time, but after they return to the truck, Renee's attitude changes. He starts complaining about the job and the customers, and he even starts swearing so much that it was all bleeped out during the episode. Oh, you this or that, or try to give you attitude. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is you. Rene reveals that he doesn't like his co-workers and the customers, which he keeps insulting, which is not an acceptable behavior for Rick. So for me to see individuals out there not working as a team frustrates me. But I don't believe you can be a team when you're just, you're just one person. As one of their core values is treating customers with tolerance. Later on, after their break, Rene reveals that he even got into a fight with a customer because the customer was late to receive the package and they got into an argument about it and it led to a fight. 
Rick's. Rick is shocked to hear all this, and he calls Renee's boss in private and tells him about the situation. He tells the manager that this is not an acceptable behavior for an employee to have, and tells him to do something immediately. The next day, Rick travels to Santa Rosa, California, and he goes there because his next job is to work in the mobile bottling line. I'm here today in Santa Rosa, California. I'm gonna be working on one of our mobile bottling lines. He meets up with Marcos and they get right into the job, and Marcos first shows him how to properly put the empty bottles on the machine. But when Rick tries to do the same thing, he messes up the first batch. And this was a job that needed perfection, and Wick was simply a disaster. I was somewhat of a disaster unloading the bottles, and they were falling down everywhere. Marcos then moves him to the packaging station, which is an easier job, but Rick was too slow at the job, and the whole operation had to be stopped. Jay, he didn't have a clue what a bottling line does. You know, you got overwhelmed over here. Yeah, a little bit. Rick's next is moved to a labeling station, which is more of an easier job, and this time he actually does well. For his last job, Rick travels to Healdsburg, California to work as a wine taster. Kendall Jackson owns multiple other wine brands, and the wine tasting stores are where customers are introduced to the newer brands. So Rick wanted to make sure that the tasting process was going smoothly and that the wines were presented well. He meets up with Savannah, and she first teaches him how to greet customers and teaches him how to taste wine. I'm gonna have you smell the wine, so you can kind of get the fruit or the flavors. I mean, it smells, it smells good. He then takes the lead in serving the customers and starts well, but he gets a little overwhelmed when there were a lot of customers. While working with Savannah, he sees how good of a saleswoman that she is, and she was also really good communicating with the customers, and offers them the right deal. So if we join the wine club... You choose from the mix, which is occasional whites and reds, and then you get that deal 50% off. She was very attentive to the customer's needs, which makes them like her more. And on their break, he learns that she's a single mother of three and works a lot to support them. And finally, Rick's undercover time comes to an end, and he invites his employees to reveal his true identity. So guys, if you like this episode, just wait for the next undercover boss who will meet an employee that hates the customer's guts, and this will force her to do something that's never been done in undercover boss history. Now back to the episode. First to find out Rick's true identity was Renee, and Rick was very disappointed with him, and he didn't really waste any time to confront him about his behavior. Renee defends himself by saying that his three years of frustration just came out, and that he wasn't really like that usually, but Rick tells him that he's suspended from being a truck driver for the next 30 days, and in that time, he tells him that he's gonna work in an office so he can better understand their work and appreciate it more. Rene wasn't happy that he was getting taken off the job, especially since he hates working in an office, but he agrees to do it as to not lose his job. It's, it's gonna be very difficult. Nobody wants to work in an office once you've been a driver. It's really hard to tie up a, 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 free, a, a freelance job. Next in was Laura, and he tells her that he likes her energy and offers her a free management training program so she can get a promotion. He also tells her that he's starting a language training program to help with the communication issue, and he then gives her $10,000 to pay for her student loans. He really wants me to do well in this company. It means a lot to me. I think it's incredible. Next in was Savannah, and he tells her that she was a great employee, and offers her a full-time job at the company, which comes with full benefits and a $5,000 raise. I just feel so honored, you know, from everything I've gone through, the days I was homeless, and I, at night there was nowhere to go. Lastly was Marcos, and he tells him that he was very impressed with him, and he gives him $5,000 for transportation costs, and informs him that he'll be the first winner of the Kendall Jackson Life Achievement Award, which comes with a $10,000 bonus, and lastly gives him another $10,000 for a family vacation. The only thing for me, I wish to, for Jess to be there, you know, to thanks to the members, but... Let us now follow our next boss, the Chief Brand Officer of Boston Market, Sarah. My name is Sarah Bidorf, and I'm the Chief Brand Officer at Boston Market. Headquartered in Denver, Colorado, Boston Market offers homestyle comfort food at 470 locations across the United States. With an annual revenue of half a billion dollars, Boston Market is one of the largest restaurant chains in the world. 
Boston Market was started in 1985 by two guys that had their grandmother's recipes. The company was first named Boston Chicken and it saw a lot of success in its first four years. The company had 1,200 restaurants across the country, which was an immense growth for a company that young. This eventually led to the company being overwhelmed and they declared bankruptcy shortly after. The company then rebranded as Boston Market and started again, and now they've become successful and this time they're able to manage with success. Sarah joined the company as the chief brand officer and her goal is to keep the company on succeeding. Sarah will be going undercover as Rachel, a diner waitress who hopes to open her own restaurant. For her first job, Sarah travels to Duluth, Georgia to work as a shift supervisor. I'm in Duluth, Georgia today to work as an hourly shift supervisor. She meets up with Ronnie, who shows her around and tells her the basic rules of the company. As he shows her around, Ronnie reveals that he doesn't really like how many rules the company has, and he thinks that the company's too strict on following their standards. It shouldn't be a question, you should be forcing it down their throat, because that is what corporate has told us to do. And he's also not fond of the customers as well. Ronnie also describes himself as a diva, which Sarah took as a joke when he first met her, but when she hears his opinions on the company, it becomes more concerning. Sarah ignores his comments for now, thinking that they might still be a joke, and she tries to focus on the job. But Ronnie again tells her that he also doesn't like the mundane job, so he gives it to her. He also continues his rant, and this time, he focuses mainly on customers, and he reveals that he doesn't really like the customers, and that he's had a particular hatred for kids and the elderly. Children and old people are literally the worst I've ever seen in my entire life, because none of them know what they want, and they're like, literally can't talk. He then starts insulting customers and disparages the company for putting the customers on a pedestal. This really pisses off Sarah and she goes outside to take a break and decides what to do with Ronnie. Bosses don't usually blow their own cover, but for the first time in undercover history, Sarah calls on Ronnie and reveals her true identity right at the restaurant. She then confronts him about his behavior, and Ronnie tries to defend himself by saying that his comments weren't that bad and that he was just a bit of a drama queen. But as you've guessed it, that excuse doesn't really work out for him, and she fires him on the spot. So, so go home, and um, Neil will follow up with you. So. That's it? That's, that's all? For her next job, Sarah travels to Tampa, Florida to work as assistant general manager. Today I'm in Tampa, Florida, and I'm going to be working as an assistant general manager. She meets up with Sash, and she first teaches her how to prepare a chicken. Sarah then tries to do what she learned, but she struggles to cut the chicken. Rachel skills with the knife. Uh, it's awkward. The chicken's already dead. You're really not going to do anything to it that isn't really already done. And because Sash was a good teacher, Sarah did better throughout the day. On their break, Sarah learns that employees don't really get any breaks because of the workload, and they also don't get paid as much for what they do. The next day, Sarah travels to Fort Lauderdale, Florida to work at the drive-thru and Today I'm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I'll be working in the drive-thru. She meets up with AJ, and they get right into the job. AJ teaches her the basic skills of working in a drive-thru, which Sarah then tries to apply and does pretty okay at first, but during the lunch rush, the demands begin to pile up and she starts to struggle. The drive through is really stressful. Somebody's ordering in your ear and then someone's waiting at the window and then to put the clock on top of it is just a very stressful combination. AJ then helps her out and while working with him, she sees how good of an employee he is. For her last job, Sarah travels to North Carolina to work with another assistant general manager. Today I'm in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I'm going to be working as an assistant general manager. She meets up with April, who shows her around and explains to her how everything is done. April is very good at her job. Hey, Chip. Okay. Time to speed it up. She's like the Energizer Bunny. I'm thinking I'm going to have a hard time keeping up with April. I mean, she's already going pretty fast. And she wants to grow within the company, but she tells Sarah that people who come from the outside with a degree will get a better chance than people who already work inside the company. She reveals that once she finishes college, she might need to leave the company just because she wants to get a better position. Oh, I always dream about moving up a corporate ladder. I'm in school, I'm in college, yeah. Really? Yes! Oh, that's fantastic. And finally, Sarah's undercover time comes to an end, and she's invited her employees to reveal her true identity. First in was Sash. She tells her that she had a great time with her, and then gives her a promotion to a general manager, and gives her a $20,000 bonus. When I think about the future, it feels so much easier. It feels 
like I'm gonna be okay. And... Next in was AJ, and she tells him that he was an amazing employee, and offers him the supervisor position. She then goes on to give him $20,000 so he can chase his dreams. Such a blessing. It's... I don't even know where to start. It's just... God works in mysterious ways. Last in was April, and Sarah had a great time with her, and she was also impressed by her ambition, so she promotes her to a general manager, and then gives her $20,000 for her college tuition, and another $5,000 bonus to do with whatever she likes. I have never had a job that would step up and say, you know what, we see what you're doing, and we appreciate it, and we want you to stay with us. And that does it for today's episode of Undercover Boss.